So I'm Beth Bonfilio. I'm a clinical nutritionist. Um, I completed my studies in the UK um, at Stonebridge College. Um, and when I came to Australia, um, I had very extreme feeding difficulties with my son, Ryder. So I certainly have skin in the game. Um, we have overcome all odds with regards to my son. He also has Pyrrhal's disorder. Um, he was also diagnosed with quite a severe sensory processing disorder, so um, no neurological connection to his senses. Um, he had a food neophobia, particularly towards foods that are green or creamy. It was a struggle to keep weight on him. Later, he would go on to refuse bottles. He would cry after being fed. He had constipation, eczema, um, and he was later diagnosed with celiac disease disease and a dairy allergy. So um, we tick, tick, tick just about every single box. I search on both sides of Australia for help for my son. My family comes from the East Coast and I found it very difficult to find someone who could help. And so after finding very little multidisciplinary help, I began researching the cause and treatment for children with feeding disorders, particularly in the, in the sensory field. And so I then decided, because I already had the nutritional backing, that I decided to become my, my child's uh, therapist um, by learning everything I need to know about feeding disorders. Um, I'm trained as a feeding therapist and I have been for nearly seven years now. I've been helping hundreds of families worldwide with children with mild to extreme feeding issues. Uh, I don't just get kids eating again, and this is the unique thing about me, I don't just get them eating ice cream or biscuits, I get them eating a healthy diet, even the most extreme of picky eaters. But I also bring families together through the love of food and I think that's something that is quite unique to the programs that I run. Um, when we talk about fe paediatric feeding issues within this webinar, I'm particularly talking about the age bracket of 18 months to 10 years old. So that is the category of a paediatric term. And when I talk about picky eating, uh, I want you to know that picky eating is very common. When I talk about picky eating, it is very common. It's a developmental stage in children um, that most children will go through. A fear of new things is called neophobia. It's a natural instinct to protect us from things uh, that may want to kill us. Uh, it's not only a human trait, but also protects the animal kingdom from coming to harm with things that they really should not be eating um, in, the, in, the, in the wild. So this is why health, well-meaning health professionals um, that you will go to for help will tell you things like, he's fine, he'll grow out of it, he's, a, he's on a healthy percentile, so no need to worry, or my favourite, um, just up the amount of formula that your child is having and then they'll be able to receive every single nutrient um, they need. That is one of my pet peeves, that one. Yes, picky eating is common, but there is something that can definitely be done about it and most problem feeders start out as a picky eater first. I'm going to go through a little uh, few statistics with you in a little while. Um, but the restricting habits do manifest and become so severe that medical effects start to step in to further distance the child away from healthy eating habits. So just how big a problem is this? Now this information is fresh out of um, a conference, the seventh annual paediatric feeding disorder conference that was in the US a couple of weeks ago. I didn't personally attend, but they do put all of their presenters, um, they record them and, and make them available for um, later viewing. So this is the second year that I attended. Um, and this figure here um, has grown since it was last year. So paediatric feeding disorders affects two to 29% of children. Now, just to give you an idea of numbers, that is 8.7 million children between those ages I, I said to you before, just in the USA alone. So the chances drastically increase above 25% um, to around 40% if you're a child who has medical complex issues and have, have done from birth, including things like premature infants, um, medical or de developmental conditions, autism spectrum disorder, food allergies, genetic disorders, and also chronic illnesses. Now, that figure can also grow up to 80%. If you have a child with profound cognitive um, disabilities like autism or severe autism, um, which would be a low-functioning Down syndrome or any brain injury as a result from losing oxygen um, around birth. Now, what is the prevalence of paediatric feeding disorders compared to other high-priority feeding issues? Now, you can see here that it's actually one of the most common. You can see there that um, 
this, this recent issue coming from Godet's group has shown that paediatric feeding disorders are probably at 15 to 16%. And this puts the prevalence of childhood obesity, this puts it in the prevalence of childhood obesity, but higher than other considered disorders or other highly talked about disorders like autism spectrum disorder and paediatric cancer. It is for this reason that Feeding Matters do hold a summit of global professionals each year in the USA uh, to tackle this issue, which is fast becoming an epidemic within our young population. So what's the difference between a problem feeder and a picky eater? Now, there are two things that we as parents would just absolutely love to control, and that is the consumption of food and the ability of a child to sleep solidly and peacefully upon request. It is, however, a harsh reality of parenting when we realise that the power of these two things are completely out of our hands. Is it normal? I don't like to use the word, word normal. When it comes to picky eaters, there is no normal. In fact, when it comes to children, there's no, there's no normal. And this is probably because there's so many factors and variables that are normal to coexist. So I'll give you an example. Understanding a typical, typical intake of food and behaviour around food is really key to understanding um, if help is required to be able to eradicate some of those symptoms. I know of many children who will seemingly eat everything, but they have no interception, which is the ability to feel full. They may be using food as a sensory input to some kind of discomfort that they're experiencing in the body as well. And that's why it's really so important not to compare your child against any others, because even the best feeder could be experiencing sensory difficulties as well. Now, is my child a picky eater? So here are some signs that your child is a typical picky eater um, with a few simple techniques. They can grow out of picky eating. I'm going to give you some statistics on probability there in a little while. Um, so fluctuation between percentiles is quite, um, quite normal. Um, what, you, what isn't normal, however, is if you have a child who is seemingly sitting around the 25th percentile and they suddenly drop off the percentile chart, that is not considered normal. And that is um, a, a cause for getting in touch with a, um, a feeding therapist immediately. But fluctuating between a couple of percentages is definitely typical. Elimination of foods that were previously preferred. Now that is quite typical, but what we want to be seeing is that the child is branching onto other foods and not continually diminishing the range of foods and also complete food groups. Um, eating over 600 calories one day and seemingly nothing the next. What I like to do is take a food diary over around five days when I'm dealing with, um, with children so I can basically um, assure the parent that they have more of a picky eater because the child will seemingly eat more calories one day than the next rather than a problem feeder who don't seem to meet their um, macro or micronutrient uh, needs each day. So young children would typically prefer carbohydrates over fibre-rich foods. Now, this is very typical. The reason why is because we raise children on a predominantly carbohydrate diet right from birth. Breast milk is sweet, so is formula. And these are the two, I guess, life sources that they get when they're, when they're quite young. So they're going to naturally prefer things that turn to sugar in the body. Um, illnesses such as cold and flu will naturally decrease the consumption and willingness to eat. I mean, every single child has that inbuilt ability to be able to shut off hunger when they're trying to heal from something. And this is something called autophagy, not something I cover in this webinar, but it is quite normal for a child to go off food. And the best advice I can give you is just allow that to happen. Just offer lots of fluids. Okay, but we are... Um, we're going to move on to problem feeder, understanding the issues that depict, but these are not solitary indicators that you have a problem feeder. So just one of these things alone will not depict that you have a problem feeder. You would normally need a couple. Sometimes you may have things from the picky eater column and a couple of things from the problem feeder column. And so emotional reaction around food would be considered uh, not typical. So crying, gagging, vomiting, or um, a real fright freeze response of anxiety. Documented nutritional deficiencies, rapid growth decline or completely falling off the growth chart, like I mentioned before. Poor energy or uh, frequent meltdowns when hungry. Oral challenges that make it very hard to swallow or chew. 
A sensory challenge that impairs the sensory input, i.e., you know, the way it feels, looks, or smells. They have a lot of a, a trouble with certain textures. They eat less than 15 foods um, and is prone to dropping safe foods and not replenishing with other foods. And they often eat a different meal to the rest of the family. Avoids whole food groups. Now, I would normally say if you hit this target here and, and a couple of others, then you, uh, you, I would suggest that you get some help because they, you'll see in a slide ahead that um, they could be missing quite some vital uh, micronutrients. Uh, and also, if your child eats with distractions, toys, technology or TV, and it's been really difficult to extract uh, that technology from them, the situation is quite likely only going to get much worse. I get asked by a lot of people, what are the chances that they will grow out of it? And the statistics tell us that one in four picky eaters, well, three in four will grow out of it naturally, but one in four picky eaters will progress to being a problem feeder. So more of the problems from um, the problem feeder list will start to manifest. And then it may turn into, um, into including some medical signs. Um, and one in four problem feeders will simply grow out of it, three won't. Okay. Now, uh, statistics from the quiz. Most of you may have already completed um, this questionnaire. It's a series of 27 questions aimed at developing uh, a close estimate. It's not completely accurate, um, obviously, because there's so many different um, psychosocial uh, factors that I can't possibly take into consideration into a short quiz. It's only meant to take five minutes. Um, but it's a closest estimate to decide whether you're dealing with a picky eater or a problem feeder. Um, the, the link uh, is shared below there if you want to take down that link. Otherwise, you can find this quiz on my website and also my Facebook page if you'd like to take it. Before, you were half as likely to have a male picky eater as a female picky eater. However, that has now slightly shifted towards 62%. I used to say when this quiz has, had first started out that you were three times more likely to have a male picky eater than a female, and it looks like that number is sli slightly starting to shift back towards that way. So certainly if you have a, um, um, a, a, a male um, a toddler, um, they're unfortunately much more likely to develop feeding issues. We don't know why that is. Okay, 91% uh, of you worry about the nutritional intake of your child. Now, there is reason for concern, and you'll see that in, in an upcoming slide. Uh, and 72% of you are cooking a separate meal for your child each night which is quite a worry. It, it does cause a lot of stress with the family if, if there's certain family members on a, a completely separate diet. And question 17, 84% of you have said that you expect that your child has a lot of sensory difficulties with regards to textures, tastes and appearances of food. That statistic there is absolutely not surprising to me. And I keep an eye on this figure because I need to make sure that the program that I put together to eradicate picky and problem feeding is in line with what people are reaching out to to say that they are having issues with their child. So um, that, that figure rarely moves. It, 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 is, it seems quite stagnant. And 31% uh, of you, a third, just about a third of um, people who completed the questionnaire have said that they've chosen option one and two on the poo chart, which indicates that the child's constipated. Now, you'll be very surprised at how many people don't know that their child is constipated. If you have a child who... Um, who they, can, they can still go to the toilet regularly every single day, but for a child who has a very small... Di um, digestive tract, especially the lower intestine, there is little, there's little for that food to travel. Therefore, there's not a, ho a whole lot of um, opportunity for liquids to be extracted from that feces. Therefore, they should be depositing as normal a very sticky consistency, almost like um, a sausage meat consistency. It should stick to underwear or a nappy, if you know what I mean. It shouldn't be solidly formed. If you've got a child under the age of six and they're, they're passing solidly formed deposits, then you have a child who is either mildly or severely constipated, just depending on how often they go. So the, the, the nutritional intake um, comparison and what we do know from the Edmund study is when he measured micronutrient deficiencies levels in children, 
um, who have been categorised in the problem feeder segment is that they are getting enough macronutrients, um, so their carbohydrates, fats, uh, dietary fibres um, and proteins, they're getting enough of that. However, um, although this won't have an impact on their physical growth and what they appear to look like and where they appear on the percentile chart, um, they will appear to be growing quite typically. A well-meaning doctor will look at that physical appearance and look at the way they slot on a percentile chart and consider the child to be healthy. Um, but I do urge you to consider that those vitamin and mineral deficiencies um, that um, is, is quite possible, according to the Edmund study, um, they are going to play quite a significant role in their global behaviour. Now, the Edmund study found significant differences and deficiencies in vitamins and mineral intake, particularly vitamin C, which you can see there is at um, 0 0.005 minus in the minus, which means it's a deficiency. Um, vitamin C is responsible for synthesizing all of those wonderful vitamins that we get from other foods. So if you don't have enough vitamin C in your body, you're not able to absorb other nutrients that you're eating. You might as well just be eating junk because nothing is really getting absorbed. Um, a sign that your child has a vitamin D deficiency is dry skin, poor wound healing, easily bruised, and also sometimes bleeding gums. Now, this is a water-soluble vitamin, so it's not something that, um, you know, you, you store in the body. It does need to be replenished daily. So rich sources of vitamin C foods like oranges, um, uh, kiwi fruit, uh, pawpaw, they're really rich sources and recommended daily. Vitamin D deficiency. Now, you probably recognise vitamin D as the, um, as the vitamin we get from the sun. Um, it, 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 this may be present, a, a vitamin D um, deficiency is usually present in a child who has frequent illnesses and, oh, you know, could be a little bit fatigued, tired, um, have um, a little bit of a problem concentrating or regulating their emotional, um, emotional output. Uh, vitamin B group is the feel-good vitamin group and predominantly found in red meats, uh, chickpeas, fish and tofu. A deficiency is rare and most likely caused by malabsorption uh, due to lack of vitamin C and poor gut health. So signs that your child has a vitamin B deficiency, it can be present in tingling hands and feet, Confusion, anemia, so that's hair falling out or pale in, uh, pale in complexion. Depression, poor emotion uh, and poor emotional regulation as well. What was really surprising to find out is that children appear to be quite low in carotene as well. Now, this is, the, um, this is what we get from carrots and oranges, or orange types foods. It deficiency it presents itself as dry and itchy eyes, night blindness, and delayed growth and poor wound healing again. So other studies have also shown that children who have a poor diet will be deficient in zinc, probably because we um, a grain-based diet, um, diets that are based on rice and corn and wheat, um, do deplete the amount of zinc that we have in our body. Calcium, now this is quite a conundrum. Did you know that the more milk you drink, the less calcium you're able to absorb. I won't, I'm not going to go into that right now in this session, but also the amount of fibre will also impact on problem feeders. Now, micronutrient deficiencies impact attention, learning, appetite, the taste perception. Zinc is one of those, and also iron. If you have a child low in zinc and iron, their ability to be able to taste things accurately um, is quite impaired. Uh, they will obviously be quite fatigued, normally um, having a meltdown by the end of the day. Um, motor coordination and function is always, um, always a difficult one to maintain. Deficiencies in fibre can obviously take a, a greater impact in bowel function as well, causing constipation. A multidisciplinary approach with dealing with um, a picky and problem feeders is important, but also broadening their sensory skills to invoke a whole body holistic evaluation um, and exercise. We know that children with difficulty feeding extend past just the inability to chew and swallow food. We need to include all the sensory capabilities, including all eight sensory systems. 
postural ca capacities. So being able to cross the midline with the knife and fork, um, maintain spatial awareness of the table and where they are with regards to their food on, in, in front of them. Um, also their spinal alignment. These capacities then support gross, fine and, and oral motor skills. Now, you probably know or have learned in class that we have five senses. We've got the visual, the tactile, the auditory, the olfactory, and the gustatory, which is obviously your vision, touch, hearing, smell, and taste. Now, you probably didn't realize that we have three internal senses. Um, and so proprioception is the vestibular and interoception. Um, that's your, that's your, part of your internal systems. It's least known, but it's equally as important as the better known five senses on the left. Now, proprioception is the mind's awareness to where the body is in space. It's a spatial awareness. Now, a, cl a classic example of this is if, a, if you have a child who appears to be quite clumsy or if they're perhaps having to balance on a stool um, to clean their teeth, they find cleaning their teeth quite difficult. But if their feet are, are placed firmly on the ground, then they find that um, quite, quite easy. You will find that they'll probably have a um, proprioception difficulty. Now, the vestibular is based around balance and orientation in space to gravity. Um, often your vestibular and your proprioception systems work very closely together, especially at meal times. Interoception is the ability to read the body's internal messaging system. So telling your body that you're full, you're thirsty, you're hungry, you're not feeling too well. Um, and obviously pain and discomfort are going to be these things that you need your child to be able to communicate to you. So eating is obviously very, very complex. It is not something that all of us are born with. Not all of us are very good at this. If you think about it, the food, what it looks like, what it feels like in the hands and mouth, its smell and taste, and, and what it sounds like to chew, are all of, these, um, all of this information that's coming in and needing to be sorted into different categories. Then you have the body, maintaining your posture where your body is in relation to space and the food, attending to hunger, a satiation and also your thirst cues. These are all more things that are going through the mind when the child's eating. But also, you probably haven't considered the environment, maintaining your posture, your social engagement with others, and managing smells, sounds, and visual input, input from the room are also very important as to supporting children who are having a lot of difficulty with eating. Now, the more challenged your sensory systems are, the less food your child is likely to eat. Now, I'll explain that. So making sense of sensory informa information, like I've mentioned there on the slide, requires modulation. Now, that's a neurological function where the brain processes and organises all the information for storage later. So say, for instance, you go to a... Um, Okay, so say for instance you have a child who will devour a plate of food one day and then seemingly not like that food next time it's ser served up. That may indicate that the child is having a little lack of modulation, being able to store information from later use. Now, a child also requires discrimination. So organising and interpreting different stimuli within a single sensory system, knowing the difference between foods that are bumpy, lumpy, hard, sweet and sour, all from one piece of food. Um, so, for instance, you may, have, um, you may have placed a tablespoon of peas on the plate, but if that's accompanied by mashed potatoes, perhaps some meat with some gravy, um, there will appear more than just a tablespoon of peas on that plate. They're going to see 100 peas. They're going to be quite overwhelmed. Now, especially if the environment is challenging. If you've got a very challenging environment, you've got lots of noise, lots of objects on the table, in front of them, different smells coming from the kitchen, maybe one of the siblings are crying, their tolerance in the amygdala, so that, that uh, part of the brain that controls the fright-flight um, reaction in a child when they've had too much sensory input is going to explode and, and they're going to reach breaking point long before the meal has even reached the table. It's a very hard thing, it, it's a very hard thing to balance but um, I do have some techniques coming up um, on, on one of the coming slides. Now I always get asked by parents, I can't help 
decide whether the mealtime antics that I'm experiencing are behavioural or reactive. Now, this is one of a really, really good question, so I thought I would cover it um, in this webinar. Now, the types of um, reactive communication is touch aversion, so not wanting to go near food, expulsion, so spitting out or throwing food, overstuffing, food refusal, restrictive food range, so only, um, only requiring foods that come in certain packages or disruptive behaviours where they're just crying and screaming at the, at the dinner table. Now, I like to think of these symptoms not as a behavioural reaction, but rather a form of communication that their sensory threshold has been reached, probably long before you've even dished out the food. And this is something I explain um, within the program or, or how to measure that anyway. Um, so the, the inability to be able to organise or process to, the, and make sense of the senses is, is a part of the reason this reactive communication is coming out. And that's why when dealing with a child, particularly one with speech difficulties or, or information processing difficulties, that you put in place visual cues to help a child process thoughts and expectations around their responsibilities at the dinner table ahead of the mealtime or food hitting the table. So for kids who are heavily reliant on using their visual skills, so a child that really needs to look at the chair to be able to see where they are in relation to it, um, they're, they're going to be quite reliant on... Um, they're going to, their senses are going to be quite clouded with intaking information from the food that's in front of them. Therefore, it's really beneficial to support them with lots of visual cues and charts. What we also find is that children also have the inability to perform an action based on a spoken direction. So being able to take direction like, um, you know, take a bite, put it on your fork, um, take a sip, uh, blow it if it's hot. They are less likely to be able to execute that action based on that command because they're really unable to process th that information because of so much that's going on in front of them. Eating is an extremely complex bilateral uh, skill set using both left and right side of the brain, but also the whole body, all the senses, a whole bunch of musculars stacked on top of each other, all the, all the sensory system, eight sensory systems. You can imagine now why it's such a complex uh, involvement that requires the child to literally be taught how to eat. In the child's early um, eating experience, when um, typically there is no feeding disorder or sensory delay suspected, um, so this is normally when children, you know, um, are, are showing signs of being some kind of sensory processing dis disorder delay or before any type of disability has been diagnosed, often parents will feed in a typical fashion um, not making appropriate modifications um, to the child's um, unique skill deficit. Now, we see this in so many ways where a parent is preparing the food but, ser but the serving sizes are large or the expectation um, is for them to feed themselves when they're really not up to the task. Um, their bite sizes are huge um, and the way they're engaging with the child is really quite problematic or uh, a little too much for the, the new eater to take in. So typically, if the expectation of the child is mismatched with the child's skill set to be able to execute the expectation of the parent, what you typically get is a child that will use behaviour uh, as a modality to ex communicate and express their dissatisfaction with the mealtime experience. And what you'll also get is a parent who's going to start going around and around and around in a stress cycle, trying to bring new technique onto getting this child to feed. We see this over and over again. So children then start to develop very learned avoidance behaviours or feeding aversions. So what modality is used to overcome this mismatch and how can we pinpoint what shortcomings your child has with eating? So we do have um, visual intervention strategies. These are the type of intervention um, strategies that I like to use in our programs. These are just a couple of them. You can see there that... Um, we have visual cues around what, to, what is expected around eating. We also have visual cues around all the food groups and what's expected of them to be able to maintain a healthy balance each day. We also have a sensory placemat so that they're encouraged to look at the visual cues and touch and interact with food each day. We also have uh, a visual cue based around um, a particular technique called the four bowl technique. I won't go into that technique um, at the moment. But that, um, 
that uh, touch by sniff kiss lick nibble chart there um, with lack of a lack of a better word for it um, is available from the little fuss pot site for free if you scroll to the home page scroll all the way down to the bottom um, you'll be able to get visual chart for free these are four ways in which you can provide strategy immediately to be able to make a dramatic difference in the way your child feels comfortable and supported at the table and now the first one is provide postural support Supportive seating arrangement with a backrest and foot support are important. If you sit at a table at a bench with no back and foot support, you're going to find that your child has got absolutely no time and tolerance for sitting at that table to eat. Now, I've got a free YouTube video on my YouTube channel. If you just type in little fuss pot, you'll be taken to my channel. And one of them on there is the 12 steps that you should take prior to meal times. I suggest you give that a watch. It's quite helpful. Um, and, you know, you don't need any fancy seats. You don't need to go out and buy things like booster seats unless you have a very young child that doesn't like to be in a high chair. You really should have everything available at hand to be able to support them. Um, but the good thing about supporting them is that you're going to get a maximum longevity of the time that they're willing to sit at the table, which inevitably will ensure that they're going to eat or attempt to eat a little more on that plate. So um, we also want to decrease the multi-sensory demands from the environment. So things like dimming the lights or removing extra visual or auditory input. So making sure the table is clear from view, making sure there's not piles of washing, you know, stacked around the table, um, making sure things like radios and TVs are completely switched off. Even Don't just even turn the sound down of the TV because that still provides a, um, a visual input. Completely turn that off as well. So not only does this really cloud the senses, all of these things, but it's a distraction which, worsens this, which you know, further worsens the sensory delay that your child is going to have with food. So um, also alter your engagement with the child. Make conversation very light. Uh, use a softer voice. If you're experiencing anxiety ahead of a meal, um, try to leave the anxiety in the kitchen. I have some anxiety strategies within the program. Um, use light and um, uplifting conversations, maybe something like a child's achievement throughout the day or, or a funny thing that happened that day. Make it very, very light and try to refrain from reminding the child over and over again to eat, put in visual strategies instead. Decrease the sensory demands from the food. Things like drying off the food, um, removing the sauces and, and allowing just the dry food, putting the sauces in a separate container, um, cool them down to really dumb down the flavour. Um, present the food with visual order. Um, also separate some challenging foods into a, a, you know, a separate bowl on the plate so that it's an option for them to remove that if it's just too much sensory input. And... Last but not least, now I cover this particular topic in about four stages. So this is going to be just a very quick overview, but um, using one sense at a time, what you really want to be doing is taking notice of the child's favourite toys and activities that they like to play with and try to alter bringing food into that play script so that they're starting to really become comfortable around certain foods. You should be doing that before you get a child to even use the touch, blow, sniff, kiss, lick, nibble chart. They should at least be comfortable with touching it first. So the Little Fuss Pot programs, what we do is we typically cover four domains. And the first thing we do is we unravel and eliminate any medical causes that your child could be dealing with, um, um, things like um, constipation, any upper respiratory um, reasons why they're not able to, um, you know, um, eat, eat food or feel hungry. Those are, are tackled really early on. I'm a nutritionist, so any type of removal of food in the diet is conducted in a very controlled environment as well. Um, we also cover nutritional balance. Um, that's one of the first things that we do in the program. Without covering nutritional balance, we're not going to open up a hunger in the child. So that is um, tackled in step two. You'll see what we tackle in the steps in just a little while. And then what we're also doing is we're teaching you feeding skills um, through the sensory enrichment therapy program. And we're also changing the paradigm of psychosocial and environmental factors related to the child, the caregiver, the feeding environment um, that may be really detrimental to the interpersonal relationships and the interaction that that child has with food. So typically we start with presenting 
uh, complexity, complexities and modalities to the parent in the first part of the program. Now, if we teach a parent what the symptoms are um, with regards to what deficiencies they have with regards to food and also um, sensory abilities, then they're going to be able to match um, with help the therapy strategies in the upcoming steps. So this is the timeline. Um, what I'm covering here is three programs in one. So we have, I'm going to explain a little later what programs we have, but we typically have a picky eater program. We have a problem feeder program and a problem feeder plus. So the first step we go through is cause and balance. We determine the cause and we balance out the diet. Tolerating, so we're reducing sensitivity around foods and eliminating meltdowns. That's really balancing out the environment. Next, we're interacting and we're rewriting neuro pathways with food, getting them to interact and become friends with food. Then tasting, so building flavour profiles, bridging the gap between look, refuse to touch, blow, sniff, kiss, lip, nibble, and eating. Building new foods into a regular rotation menu and then stretching food preferences. So we're giving that just right change to already preferred foods. Now, these are the six steps that you will cover in a picky eater program, but there is one step further and there's a few other, a few um, topics here that aren't covered in the problem feeder program. And I'll just quickly um, pick those out now. So in the problem in the picky eater program, we don't cover autism spectrum disorder and sensory processing disorder in the cause and balance. In interacting, step three, we don't cover the, um, the placemat technique and we also don't go through the Fudo guided app. Uh, and that's it for those ones. Actually, no, there was one more. And we also don't go through the visual mealtime routine with regards to eating. But there's a new seventh step. This, this new step was um, released in September, and this is for your older generation of children from school age onwards. And what this is is um, to empower your child. So what you're doing is once you've gone through these six steps, you're encouraged to empower your child. You're handing over the reins and saying, right, you're old enough to be able to maintain and build new foods into your own diet. Here are the steps in which to do this. So there's six extra um, topics there that we cover um, in the Problem Feeder program, the Problem Feeder Plus program. All right, so here is a snapshot of before therapy and post therapy. The pre-therapy is in the green, the, the post-therapy is in the pink. And what I always do with each client is I take a, um, a pre-assessment questionnaire and I ask questions based on satisfaction of quantity so the quantity um, of food that the child is eating, um, the child's relationship with the food, the child's nutritional balance, the enthusiasm that a child has around food, the tools that a parent has uh, to be able to, um, you know, tackle the feeding issues on their own, and also the whole overall mealtime experience. And you can see there that um, we may... This is just in six weeks. I encourage people to to take the um, assessment right at the beginning, a week before we start, and immediately in the last week. Um, so this is in six weeks. This is what we've been able to achieve in six weeks. Now I'm going to play, with, uh, play for you a little video. This, um, this family here, um, Austin on the right there, the baby, he's not a baby anymore. This is a couple of years ago. Um, but he, we detected quite early on that he was presenting with um, some quite severe medical issues that unbeknownst to the family were causing um, Austin to really not feel hungry and so right from birth they they had these symptoms that um, they, you know they went from specialist to specialist and they had absolutely no idea until they spoke to me um, um, how to put it all together and, and make sense of it so I'm going to play this clip for you <laughs> Ago, uh, we were really struggling with meal times for the family. Hannah was a young child, was a very fussy eater, and still is now. Austin seemed to be going down the same path, and part of me wanted to just ride it through and fix it later. But I remember looking back 12 years ago, and I didn't want to go through it all again. I googled fussy eaters, and that was the spot popped up. I met a few time clients, which were really recent and very optimistic. Paul and I discussed it and decided this was the best decision ever made. Beth and I spoke for a good hour after my discussion.
was dusted, his repeated health issues, and also the previous night in the column. If only I'd had Beth 12 years ago to help me with Connor as a toddler. I explained to Beth that Austin really didn't like meal times and it was extremely difficult to get him to eat anything some days. His neck seemed okay, but meal times were just a nightmare. I hated meal times, the stress of it all, even food shopping, preparing two or three different meals every day and then battling to actually feed the kids and keep it as healthy as possible. I wanted Christmas to be our goal, it's not long after we've been a plane to Australia and used us to be comfortable for the long plane ride and not have tummy ache or feel hungry and struggle to feed him. I also didn't want to worry all holiday about what he was going to eat and where we were going to feed him. It was hard work, um, but I sent back a quick email at Christmas saying, proud for me moment, Austin cleared his plate tonight. Big beans with a little coercion, chips and bacon. Woo! We were so pleased we were all jumping up and down in the kitchen. Austin then recorded 15 new foods in the next two weeks, including roast pork, tuna ham, fish. The Australian trip was a complete success food wise for Austin. We ate out, even at special food places, um, not just serving each type of food, and always managed to find something we could eat. So as we went on, quite quickly, Austin progressed amazingly. It's almost a year on, but he will now eat jam on toast, salami, spaghetti bolognese, roast dinners, fish, pasta. Homemade soup, teriyaki salmon, any cereals, dairy free yogurts, and lasagna that I make myself with dairy free ingredients. He also loves crackers and dips, which was a challenge to get a dairy free dip, but as it turns out, he loves tarama salata and smashed avocado dips. He doesn't eat empty, but I don't expect him to do. The only thing I've not really pushed yet are curries. He chooses a lot of food himself, especially when we're eating out. While it's her best programme, and still today, she's been so supportive, offering suggestions, tips, recipes, and any help I needed. The video meetings were a great way to do this, with us being in the UK, and obviously she being inside the world with her. But it felt like she was actually in the same room with you, so that made all the difference. Advice from me? To definitely persevere. I only wish I'd had the same help with Connor all those years ago. Good luck, everyone, and enjoy your rewards of stress-free meal times in the not-too-distant future. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to also play you another um, um, clip in a, in a little while, but what I just want to mention about that one is you notice she had taken her child completely off dairy. Now, this isn't something I do with all children, but um, it is one, one of the um, fundamental steps in the program is just balancing things out. And you often have a lot of children who are quite heavily weighted towards some foods rather than others. So in this particular situation, um, we realised that he was absolutely not tolerating dairy at all because he had a very slow digestive system. And so that is the reason why um, she started mentioning that we took him off dairy. Um, the next one I'm going to show you is, um, is, is a diff different scenario. She had probably one of the oldest children um, to join the program. He was eight at the time. Um, he's now 10. So this is the next one. Uh, this is Leisha. So he was eight at the time. Um, he'd been to, they'd been to uh, many various, very expensive specialists. In fact, she was seeing someone at the same time as she was seeing me and then ended up, um, you know, um, just, just working with the program. Um, she was on a path to being, he was on a path to being diagnosed with ARFID, um, which is Avoidant Food Restrictive Intake Disorder. Um, I won't go too much into that, but what it is, is a, so you, you're probably aware of anorexia nervosa and bulimia. This is as serious um, a, a, a um, feeding disorder. The, the, the major issue is, first of all, there's a lot of anxiety involved. The child is usually on a, like a very baby toddler-like diet. So um, very consistent foods, has to be a particular brand, um, you know, very, very restrictive, but also has a lot of anxiety built up around anything that is unfamiliar. So there's some of the characteristics. But what differentiates that from anorexia and bulimia is that there's no body image involved there. They don't look in the mirror and say, look, I'm really fat, I'm going to restrict food. It, they literally restrict based on having no ability to be able to focus, uh, to process that uh, sensory information about that food. So he was missing all fruits and vegetables from the diet. Um, there was, I'm pretty sure, yes, he was on medication for constipation um, and he had been for almost all of his life and severe sensory issues around food and he would gag frequently. This course is fantastic. We did it 12 months ago with our son and he has added foods to his diet. Beth has been available and supportive.
supportive and had fantastic ideas when things weren't working for us. It has just been a fantastic program and the difference with our story is that Beth pinpointed the cause of our cost eating um, for our son and something that um, we may never have worked out. Um, can't thank you enough. Fantastic program, home-based, easy, and like I said, Beth's support is amazing, amazing. And thank you so much, Beth. Um, uh, both both uh, mothers had mentioned support. Now, the way I... Um I build support into the program is I have a separate Facebook group and so this is a group that I only allow people who are partaking in the program in and each Tuesday I do a Facebook live of an hour and that answers anyone's questions throughout the week but also if anyone has any questions while they're going through any of the content um, within the course um, you know they're, they're quite welcome to post on that group straight away and I'm usually the first to answer because I need to approve every post that goes on so I'm quite responsive I literally ask after the next two days, I take off the, um, I'm, I literally switch gears from, you know, the social side, the social media side of things and having to sell and market this program to uh, moving into the, the part that I love, the therapist mode, where I'm actually able to help people. But seeing everyone's results, you know, that is, that is what, they, they are the moments I live for. All right, so these are the three programs that I mentioned to you. So we have, uh, they're all six-week programs. One starts a day after the other. So the, there's a lot more content to cover in the Problem Feeder program. And the only difference between those two on the right, the Problem Free Eater and the Problem Fee Free if free Feeder, is that the one on the right, um, it, although it's a little more expensive, has two one-on-one -on -one consultations, each of 45 minutes. And now this is for people who don't have a lot of support in their life. Um, or have an extremely difficult case that it's going to need my, you know, ongoing support. So the prices are two eighty nine for the first free eater, um, three eighty five for the problem free eater, and five forty nine for the um, problem fee feeder plus with the two consultations. There does come with a thirty day money back guarantee from the launch date. Now. Um, the money back guarantee is based on the expectation that you have watched and kept up and implemented um, what you can of the program. Um, and if it doesn't work for you at all, you have 30 days to be able to request your money returned to you. Now, um, this is available in any country. These are all in Australian dollars. Um, a really good um, thing I think I probably should mention is that um, being that the Australian dollar is low at the moment, if you're in the US or um, the UK, um, you'll probably get the best exchange rate on this program that you, you'll ever have. Um, and this is how you enrol. So going to my, um, my website, littlefusspot.com, you will go up to courses and it will list all three courses and it's as, simply, as simple as enrolling from that page. You'll be automatically added into a database where you'll start receiving emails and all the equipment that you'll need um, to be able to, you know, launch into the program. Don't be too concerned, even though we're launching on Sunday, you've got two weeks worth of learning before we're going to implement any of these strategies into play. So even if you're enrolling late in the day, you've still got two weeks to be able to collect those items um, um, for, for, the start, for, for actually starting to implement the technique. When you enrol, you'll be given, you'll be um, asked to produce an email and password. This email and password, when you log into your portal, immediately will give you the Picky Eater protocol. It will also give you the sensory placement and the sensory tracker and a video on how to use it and also includes the guided app. So it's, a, it's available on Apple or Android, and this app's designed to help guide your child. This is for the technology kids out there, and I think this is a really great app, and it really guides them through um, selecting new foods that they're going to try. So all of these things are used within the program, but I give you immediate access to them because they don't need a whole lot of explanation. There's videos that go along with them, and the Picky Eater pro protocol, even though it says Picky Eater, there's a lot of things in there you should probably rule out um, um, on a problem feeder scenario as well. Um, so if you wanted to purchase 
If you wanted to purchase the sensory placemat or the sensory tracker and you're not interested in, in partaking in the program at the moment, the way to do that is by going to resources. You can purchase the you can purchase all of those things together as a bundle or any of the separate items. Um, I urge you, if you're not already, to be part of the Parents of the Picky Eaters and Problem Feeders program. If there's any new information coming to light, this is where I broadcast that. Um, the reason why is because um, the, um, you know, my business page is, is, is strictly for business. This one here is really about sharing advice. Um, and, you know, if anyone has anything to contribute to that, I, I really welcome that. All right, well, that is the end of the presentation. I am, oh my goodness, on time. That is the first time ever. I'm just going to see whether there's any, no, no chat, no one's asked any questions, okay? All right, um, so that is basically it. The, uh, remember that the, um, I will be sending this recording out um, once it's condensed into a nice little file format, so you'll have plenty of time to watch that. Make sure you reach out to me on email, beth at littlefusspot.com, if you have any questions, um, particularly if, you're really, if you really want me to match the symptoms to what's involved in the program. So um, if you do have any questions, email me at beth at littlefusspot.com and um, I'll be sure to reply to any of your queries. All right, thank you for joining me. And uh, here's hoping that with the information I've supplied, you're able to start making a difference at mealtimes and start getting your child to thrive and not just survive. Take care. Thanks for joining.